from the free state of Florida. And I'm pleased to report that our great American comeback will begin when we send Joe Biden back to his basement in Delaware. I want to congratulate the uh, legislators for their success in last election. Our party didn't have great success nationwide, as you know. We did in Florida, and we did by earning the super majorities here in North Carolina. So congratulations on that, and congratulations on fixing your state Supreme Court. And that constitutional government back in the Tar Heel State. And I know you guys are going to do even better when we elect a Republican governor here in North Carolina. Y'all are one of the few in the Southeast that don't have a Republican governor. I can tell you it's better when you do. And I also look forward to, uh, as president, restoring the name of Fort Bragg to our great military the deal. American decline is not inevitable. It is a choice. Uh, it's a choice we will make as Americans over the next 18 months. And I'm running for president to reverse this decline and end the insanity that we've seen going throughout our country. If we're united, 2024 will be the year when America fights back, and fight back we will. And I can tell you it can be done because we have done it in the state of Florida. We in Florida chose facts over fear. We chose education over indoctrination. We chose law and order over rioting and disorder. When the world went mad during COVID, we stood as a refuge of sanity and a citadel of freedom for not just our own citizens, but people throughout this country and indeed throughout the world, we in Florida held the line when freedom itself hung in the balance. We refused to let our state descend into some type of Faucian dystopia where people's livelihoods were destroyed. No, we protected people's rights. We protected their jobs. We protected people's businesses. We made sure our kids had a right to be in school in person, in short, we chose freedom over Fauciism, and we are better off as a result of doing that. And here's the thing, when you're elected to an executive position, whether it's governor, president of the United States, uh, yeah, you gotta be right on policy. Lord knows we see the current guy up there gets everything wrong. So you gotta be right on policy, but that's not enough. You also have to demonstrate leadership, particularly in situations where the chips are down and the going gets tough, you gotta be the one that holds the line and stands up for people. And I can tell you during COVID, 
we made the decision very early on that we were going to chart our own course in Florida. We were not going to subcontract our leadership out to people like Dr. Fauci. We were going to take on the left. We were going to take on the media. We were going to take on the bureaucracy. And even we took on some Republicans who were criticizing what we're going to do. And I can tell you it wasn't easy doing that. I faced a lot of incoming, probably more incoming than any governor has faced in the modern history of our country. And I had supporters tell me, man, I know you think you're doing the right thing here, but uh, you may need to reverse course because you are getting filleted politically. I don't think you're going to be long for this world. You're not going to be able to win election in two years if you keep this up. And you know what? Uh, a leader at the end of the day can't be concerned with short-term political calculations over doing what's right. I had the responsibility. I had the responsibility to look out for the people that I represent, and I had to care more about protecting their jobs than I did about saving my own political hide. And so we stayed the course, we took the hits. I didn't know how it was going to work out politically, but you know what? Uh, I would rather do the right thing, be able to look in that mirror and know I did the right thing for the right reasons, than try to contort myself into some pretzel and be somebody that I'm not. So we stood our ground, and lo and behold, we were right. And Florida has thrived as a result of that. But leadership uh, is about doing what's right when you have intense opposition, when people are throwing arrows at you. Sometimes you got to stand all alone uh, for principle, and that's what we did in Florida. And I tell you this, leadership at the end of the day is not entertainment. It's not brand building. It's not virtue signaling. Leadership is about delivering results for the people that you represent. And I'm pleased to say... In Florida, we have delivered results. We are ranked number one as the fastest growing state in this country. We've led the nation in net in migration every year since I've been governor. We are number one in America for new business formations. We rank number one for economic freedom. We, of course, have no state income tax. You all should try it sometime. It works out very well. I'm just saying. We are number one, most recently, by U.S. News & World Report for education, number one for education freedom, and number one for parental involvement in education. And what we've been able to do in Florida is take these great ideas and values and principles that we all share and not just talk about them, but actually implement them as policy. In Washington, there'll be a big conservative victory once or twice a decade. In Florida, we deliver big victories every single day. We have done the following. We have prohibited the purchase of land by the CCP and related entities in the state of Florida. No farmland, nothing. We have enacted legislation to kneecap ESG in our state. No pension ESG. No social credit scores and no woke banking con con uh, discriminating against conservatives. When Hurricane Ian hit southwest Florida in September of 2022, it almost hit Category 5. It did a lot of damage, but some of the most extensive damage was it knocked out a bridge going from the mainland to Pine Island, and it severed the causeway going from the mainland to Sanibel in three different places. Now, these were not state bridges or state roads wasn't our responsibility, and the locals were being told it was going to take six months before those bridges uh, could be up and running again. So they came to me and they asked for help. And you know, some of these elected officials would say, well, I don't want to get involved in that because if I get involved in it and it doesn't work out, they're going to blame me, whatever. I'm like, no, of course I'm going to help. So we took it on. We took over the job. I got my guys together. I said, listen, uh, I don't want to hear about any bureaucracy. I don't want to hear about any red tape. And I don't want to hear any excuses. Get this done, and I'm not waiting six months. So we took, the, took over the job for Pine Island Bridge, and not six months later or three months later, we reopened the bridge three days later, and people were back to their homes. <laughs> Sanibel we did two weeks later and reopened that. And, it, and incidentally, I've told President Biden, I'll take my Florida builders and I will send them to the border wall to build it to the border. Put us in. Let us get it done. 
But it just shows you, you can always make excuses about why you can't do something. The job of a leader is to figure out how you can get it done. And we got those bridges done, and those islands are doing a lot better. We've enacted a record amount of tax relief since I've been governor, including this most recent year, $2.7 billion in tax relief focused on families. We now have no sales tax on all baby items, cribs, strollers, diapers, wipes. You raise babies tax-free in the state of Florida. We're proud of that. We've enacted universal school choice. Parents have the right to send their kids to the school that they want to. We have signed the heartbeat bill to protect unborn life in the state of Florida. We've defended Second Amendment rights by implementing constitutional carry legislation. And like North Carolina, Florida used to have a very liberal state Supreme Court. I inherited a liberal court, maybe the most liberal in the country. Well, I've since been able to appoint seven conservative justices, and we now have the most conservative Supreme Court in the entire country. We are tough on crime, and we've signed legislation to hold people accountable who commit serious crimes, whether that's dealing fentanyl, whether it's ensuring people must post bail before they're released. We have even authorized the death penalty for pedophiles in the state of Florida. And we are not going to allow anyone to defund the police. We're standing with the women, men and women in law enforcement. We've provided bonuses to our police officers. And if you move from some of these other states where they're not treated well and you get a job as a cop in Florida, you get a $5,000 signing bonus right off the top. And we're proud of standing for the police. We in Florida have recognized the menace posed by left-wing prosecutors who get elected, usually with campaign donations from people like George Soros, and they get in the office and they decide they're not going to enforce laws they don't like. So they let the criminals get away with crime after crime after crime. Of course, the crime rate goes up, the community hollows out, and it's a total disaster. When we had a prosecutor like that in Florida, who said he wasn't going to enforce laws he didn't like, I removed him from his post. He is gone. We've taken strong stands against illegal immigration in the state of Florida. We've banned sanctuary cities. We're cracking down on human smuggling. I currently have hundreds of personnel on the southern border to help Texas and we even help transport illegals to Martha's Vineyard. Very beautiful place. Florida has acted uh, aggressively to protect our citizens from the implementation of a central bank digital currency. If you don't know what they're trying to do with that, read up on it. They don't have your best interests at heart, I can tell you, so we're fighting back on that. We're also the first state in the United States to eliminate DEI from our public university system. They say it's diversity, equity, and inclusion, but in reality, it's ideology. It's an agenda that they are trying to impose, not just on students, but on faculty and staff. Indeed, DEI, the way it's practiced, better stands for discrimination, exclusion, and indoctrination, and that has no place in our public institutions. If I were here 20 years ago as a Florida uh, resident, or much less a governor, I probably wouldn't be touting our success with conducting elections. Uh, we, had some, we had some bumps in the road back in the day, but we now have uh, the most efficient, transparent election system in the country. We have banned ballot harvesting in Florida. We have banned Zuckerbucks in Florida. And we require voter ID, not just in person in the polls, but also if you want an absentee ballot, you must do voter ID. So we're doing it right, and we're ensuring the integrity of our elections. Florida has also enacted legislation to protect its citizens 
from President Biden's attempt to impose the World Health Organization lockdown treaty on the American people. We will never give up our sovereignty to the WHO in Florida, and as President, we will never do it for the United States of America. We've codified the strongest protections for medical freedom in America. No vaccine passports, no COVID shot mandates for school children, for jobs, no MNRA mandates, no emergency use mandates, and we've even banned gain-of-function research in the state of Florida. Of all the things we've been able to accomplish, though, probably uh, one of the ones that's closest to my heart is we've drawn a very clear line in the sand. In the state of Florida, the purpose of our schools is to educate kids, not to indoctrinate kids. And I'm passionate about it because I am, from a governor's perspective, want to ensure the integrity of our school system, but I'm also the father of a six, a five, and a three-year-old. And my wife and I both believe very strongly that parents should be able to send their kids to school, kids should be able to watch cartoons, kids should just be able to be kids without having some agenda shoved down their throat all the time. And in Florida, we're standing, we're standing for the rights of parents to direct the education and upbringing of their kids, including the right of every parent to know what curriculum is being used in their kid's school. So we've enacted legislation for curriculum transparency, and parents, unfortunately, have had to blow the whistle on very inappropriate materials that will be in classrooms, like pornography in a fifth grade library? I mean, are you kidding me? Now, when the parents object, book gets removed, the media on the left will say that that's akin to, quote, banning books. But of course, schools have to curate what's in and what's out. You may have one book on George Washington. There's 50 others you could have. You're not banning those other 50 books. Anyone could go buy them if you want. But you have to make decisions about what's appropriate for education. So we fought back against this. I did a press conference that we called Exposing the Book Ban Hoax, because it is a hoax. But before I said a word, before I had the parents come up, I just played on a video screen the images that the parents had actually objected to. The local news cameras, they had to cut their feed because they said it was too graphic to put on the air. Well, if it's too graphic for the six o'clock news, how is it okay for a 10-year-old school child? We have also eliminated critical race theory from our K through 12 schools. We're not teaching kids to hate each other or to hate our country with your tax dollars. Instead, we've placed a renewed emphasis on American civics, about teaching kids about our Constitution and our Bill of Rights and about what it means to be an American, because no matter what avenue they, they, uh, they choose in life, they are all going to be citizens of our republic. And it's our responsibility to graduate them with a proper foundation in understanding why our country is unique. We cannot just produce listless vessels uh, who go out there and have no conception of what it means to be an American. So in Florida, we're fighting for those key principles. And I'll tell you, it's making a huge, huge difference. We have also had major fights to ensure that gender ideology has no place in our schools. It is wrong. It is wrong for a teacher to tell a second grader that their gender is a choice or that they were born in the wrong body. And we made sure that that's not happening in Florida. I can tell you the parents in Florida, not just Republicans, all across the spectrum were thankful that we are focusing education on the basics and we're not allowing an agenda to take over our schools. Now, the left didn't like it, the media didn't like it, and there was even a little business in Central Florida that some of you may have heard of that also didn't like it named Walt Disney Company. And I know in Florida they basically called the shots for many, many decades, but there is a new sheriff in town and we don't subcontract our leadership out to woke corporations. So they can say what they want, but we are going to do the right thing. And I have some of these Republicans that are attacking me 
for standing up for the kids, and they are actually siding with Disney in this. And let me just be very clear. We stand for the protection of our children. We reject the sexualization of our children. We will fight against anybody who seeks to rob them of their innocence. And on that principle, there will be no compromise. We're standing for Florida values. We're not standing for Burbank values. And it's sad that we're even have to doing some of this other stuff. And I'm, I was happy to do it. You know, we signed legislation a couple years ago protecting women's athletics. How do you have someone swimming on the men's team for three years and then switching to the women's team and then winning the women's national championship? That is wrong. That is not true and that takes away opportunities for our girls and our women athletes. And as the father of two daughters, I think they should have good opportunities. And it's even sadder that we have to talk about this, but uh, in Florida, we reject the idea that a physician can pump some minor with puberty blockers or do sex change operations on them. We have prohibited the practice. They're trying to fight us on it, but we are going to win. It is mutilation, and it is wrong, and it has no place in our state. So here's the thing about uh, what we've done in Florida. It shows that this can be done. Uh, we're, not, we're not unique. I mean, look, we're kind of the microcosm of the country. For those of you who visited, you know, you go to Miami, that's one thing. You go to the Panhandle, that's another. And so if you can do it in Florida, you can do it anywhere. And here's what we did. We did all that stuff by leading with purpose and conviction against conventional wisdom. I got elected by 32,000 votes out of over 8 million casts. People told me Florida's an evenly divided state politically. Don't rock the boat when you get in there because you could upset that balance and you may end up on the wrong side of that. And I understood the advice because these races had been one point for like a decade. But I rejected that advice. Uh, my view is you lead boldly. Uh, you wield the power that you have to advance an agenda that reflects the core principles that we all share. And so we did that. Uh, we never, in four and a half years now as governor, ever taken a poll about what to do on a given issue. A leader doesn't put their finger in the wind and try to follow the polls. A leader sets out the vision, executes on the vision, delivers result, and guess what? the polls change in your favor once you're getting things done. So we were able to convert a lot of people to our side. So fast forward four years later, November of 2022, we didn't win by 32,000 votes. We won by over 1.5 million votes, the largest Republican governor landslide in the history of the state of Florida. And we did it by, yes, having our base come out and winning Republicans overwhelmingly. Of course you do that. But we also won independent voters by 18 percentage points. We got over 60 percent of Hispanic voters. We won women voters by 8 percent. We even took counties like Miami-Dade, 2.8 million people, 70 percent Latino. Hillary Clinton had won that in 2016 by 30 percentage points. We won it by double digits in 2022. But it wasn't just us, it's a team effort, and you need to have a rising tide to lift all boats. We now have super majorities in the Florida legislature, the largest majorities we've ever enjoyed. We added four new Republican members to the U.S. House of Representatives, without which we may not have the majority there. And we even helped to elect 29 conservative school board members across the state of Florida. And now, for the first time since the Reconstruction era, there is not one single solitary Democrat elected to statewide office in the Sunshine State. That's what you call winning. The other thing Florida shows is when we tell you that we'll do something, we're not making idle promises. Most people run, they just want to tell you what you want to hear in the moment. They get into office and they forget that they ever said that. Um, you know, I don't make idle promises. If I don't think it's possible, I don't think I can do it, uh, or I don't support it, I'll just tell you that. But when I tell you I'm going to do something, 
Even my worst critics in Florida will tell you, governor says he's going to do something. He is going to do it. So buckle your seatbelts. And that's the attitude that we have to have if we want to fix this country. And I think there's a lot we need to do, but I think we can get it done. We must restore sanity in communities throughout this country. We must restore normalcy throughout this country. And we must restore integrity to the institutions that are in this country. Truth must be our foundation. And common sense can no longer be an uncommon virtue. I pledge to be an energetic executive that will take these issues on head on. We will not back down from a fight and we will do everything we said we will do. We will not lead by merely words, we will lead by deeds. And we will begin by reversing Biden's disastrous economic policies that are harming the average American family. He is fueling inflation with the big spending and we need to stop driving this country deeper into debt. I can tell you in Florida, we run budget surpluses. We have the second lowest per capita debt ratio in the entire country. Our economy is $1.2 trillion in Florida. We'd be the 13th largest economy in the world if we were a separate country, and yet our debt is only $17 billion. What's the federal government? The debt is way more than our entire economy as Americans. And so they need to stop driving us more into debt. And I'll tell you what I did in Florida. I used the veto pen to reduce spending. I vetoed 3% of the budget last year because there was excessive spending. So you got to be willing to lean in on that and you got to be willing to rein that in. Not only will help with inflation, it'll obviously help with the next generation. We're also going to make sure that we have somebody at the Federal Reserve that's not going to print trillions and trillions of dollars like they did. Focus on a stable currency. You do not have a right to be an economic central planner. We're going to make sure we rein that in. We are also going to open up America's energy resources for production. We should be energy independent. We should never rely on another country for our energy needs. And the economy, you know, since COVID, the thing that happened with COVID, all the big companies did very well. Amazon, Facebook, they never did better. The small businesses, particularly in the lockdown states, got crushed. Big government helps big business and it hurts small business. Our economy's got to be focused on small business. That's the lifeblood of the communities throughout this country. That's who we need to be able to succeed in this country. I can also pledge that as president, I will finally be the one to bring the issue of our southern border to a conclusion. I am sick of hearing about it. I'm sick of the empty promises. I've been hearing this my entire adult life about the problems of this border. We are going to shut the border down. We are going to marshal all resources, including the military, uh, to construct a border wall. We will end mass migration into this country, and we are going to hold the Mexican government and the Mexican drug cartels accountable for the carnage they have caused in our country. We will usher in a reckoning about the disastrous lockdown policies propagated by our federal government. Mandates, restrictions, all of that had devastating impacts on communities throughout this country. In fact, there are some urban areas that clung to this for far too long that still have not recovered from the COVID restrictions. And my fear is, is that a lot of the people that have been involved with this, such as Dr. Fauci, they think what they did was right, and they will do it again if they have an opportunity. So we're going to bring accountability to everybody so that this never happens in our country ever again. We also pledge to wage a war on woke ideology. And at the end of the day, the end of the day, woke is a form of cultural Marxism. Uh, it seeks to de-emphasize core values like merit and achievement in favor of things like identity politics. Woke represents a war on truth itself. And there are people that say, oh, you know, woke, you know, who cares about it now? And I'll tell you why you care about it. 
You care about it because your society needs to be rooted in what is true. Don't tell me that a man can get pregnant. And if we accept that as a society, how are we going to get big things right? We are not. So there's a value in making sure that the truth will set us free. But there's also an impact on woke ideology on people's everyday lives. When woke takes over the economy through things like ESG, it makes the average American family poorer. When woke takes over our education uh, institutions, it makes the average student dumber. When woke, when woke does things uh, across the bureaucracy, we see how that gets corrupted. We see it, and I'll speak about the military in a minute. So woke, when it takes over the criminal justice system, it makes people less safe. So this has a direct impact on people's lives, and I would tell you that all these failed leftist governments, whether it's San Francisco, whether it's Illinois, whether it's Los Angeles, the one thing they have in common is that they're all pursuing a woke agenda. So in Florida, we fought the woke in the schools, we fought the woke in the legislature, we fought the woke in the corporations. We refused to surrender to the woke mob. We made our state the state where woke goes to die, and we will make sure as president we leave woke ideology in the dustbin of history where it belongs. We also have to restore the integrity of our military services. And I was somebody, you know, I was somebody I mentioned, you know, I'm a blue collar kid, I'm scrapping to get ahead, you know, I'm playing baseball, I'm working jobs, I'm doing all this, I'm getting degrees, having the opportunity to advance myself. I had a chance to make a lot of money uh, coming out of school. I had uh, great credentials. And, um, but you know, this was after 9-11 and I felt the calling to serve and raise my hand and volunteer. So we, we joined the Navy, we deployed to Iraq, uh, we did a lot of other things. And I'll tell you that um, you know, when you wear the cloth of your country, when you're serving alongside other patriots, when you're pursuing a mission greater than your own personal self-interest, you know, there's value to that that money just can't buy. And it's something that I know veterans are very proud of their service, and I'm very proud. And it pains me when I have veterans coming up to me now saying, I don't know that I'd recommend my kid or my grandkid join today's military. And why are they saying that? Well, I think our military has driven off a lot of really great warriors over recent years. First of all, the ridiculous COVID vax mandates. You know, you're take, telling some Navy SEAL who's already had COVID that they have to take an MNRA shot? I mean, give me a break. Uh, and so they drove off a lot of people for that. And they're driving off people with their social engineering and the political agenda that they're trying to impose on the military. Why is recruiting so low? When I was in Fallujah back in the day, People were still signing up for the Army and the Marine Corps knowing their next stop was Fallujah or Ramadi or Haditha, but they did it because they believed in the country and they felt the duty to serve. Now it's harder to people get, get them to join because they've lost focus. They're not focused on the mission. So as president and commander in chief on day one, we rip it all out of the military. All the Obama Biden nonsense is gone and we're restoring it to its glory that we all deserve. And as we restore the integrity of our military services, we are also going to restore integrity to our constitutional system. Americans founding fathers did not design a constitution with four branches of government. They designed three, legislative, executive, judicial. They did not design a fourth branch of government, an administrative state that is not accountable to the American people and that abuses its power. That's not in the Constitution. That's there because Congress has neglected its role for many decades and presidents have, not, have been derelict in their duty and using their Article II powers to discipline the bureaucracy. Well, that stops when I get in. We are not going to allow the most significant issues facing our society and economy, whether it's what kind of car you can drive, what kind of energy you can use, those decisions are not even being made anymore by your elected representatives. They're being implemented by nameless, faceless bureaucrats who you will never have the opportunity to vote out of office. And so we are going to reconstitutionalize the administrative apparatus of government. We are not going to let these agencies run our country. And And what happens is 
when there's no constitutional accountability, our founding fathers would have absolutely predicted the weaponization that we've seen with these agencies, particularly justice and FBI. Because when you don't have constitutional accountability, human nature is such that they will abuse their power. And that's what's happened. Nobody has held them accountable. And, you know, look, when I was uh, uh, in, in Congress, I remember, you know, Hillary had the, the emails with the classified. And my view was, well, gee, you know, as a naval officer, if I would have taken classified to my apartment, I would have been court-martialed in a New York minute. And yet they seem to not care about that. And is there a different standard for a Democrat secretary of state versus a former Republican president? I think there needs to be one standard of justice in this country. Let's enforce it on everybody and make sure we all know the rules. You can't have one faction of society weaponizing the power of the state against factions that it doesn't like. And that's what we've seen. And here's the thing. There is obviously very high profile examples, but there's examples of ordinary people who may not get the same headlines. A pro-life uh, advocate may have 20 FBI agents storming their house at 6 o'clock in the morning. You may have parents going to a school board meeting in Virginia that are being surveilled by the FBI. So the weaponization of these agencies strikes at the heart of what it means to have a free society. And it's not just affecting people at the top, it's affecting people all throughout our country. And what I can tell you is this, uh, we need to have a president that's going to do something about that. You can't get cowed by the left. You can't get cowed by the media from doing what is right. You got to be willing to go in there on day one and you got to be willing to spit nails. And with me, you know you'll have a new FBI director on day one. You know we'll clean out all these agencies on day one. We're going to have a major overhaul. We are going to use our authority. And here's the thing. You know, if you have like an agency working with big tech to censor information like Hunter Biden stuff, I am going to fire those people when they abuse their power. I am not just going to let them stay in our government. They're gone. We're going to have a very quick hook and we are going to make sure that we're instituting accountability. At the end of the day, we will once and for all end weaponization of government under my administration. That will happen. Here's the thing, though. You can't just do that, uh, snap your fingers. I mean, this thing has accumulated over many decades. Uh, president's got to have some humility. You got to understand you can't do it alone. You need a cadre of people surrounding you who believe in the mission and who are going to put the mission ahead of their own personal self-interest. And you can't just recycle people from inside Washington, D.C. You got to get people from outside of D.C. We're going to ask people all around this country, hey, in North Carolina, you may need to uproot your family for two, four, six, eight years to come serve in the administration because we need to reconstitutionalize this government. And I think it's a noble calling. I don't think constitutional government will survive if we continue to have it operate without accountability like we have. And at the end of the day, this bureaucracy for far too long has imposed its will on us. It's about time we impose our will on it, and we will do that. And we look, there's so much more that we're going to do, and we're going to talk about a lot more stuff over the coming weeks and months. But here's the thing. None of that matters if you don't win. There is no substitute for victory. And we have a task in front of us to shake the culture of losing uh, that has infected the Republican Party in recent years. We were supposed to have a massive red wave in November of 2022. Biden is one of the most unpopular presidents in modern history. It is just, you don't even have to campaign, some said, you're gonna see Senate and House uh, big majorities. And yet, you know, we had a red wave in Florida. Uh, we had good stuff in some other states, uh, but we had huge disappointments across the board. We have 49 Republican U.S. Senators. We should have 55 Republican U.S. Senators right now. We need to stop frittering away winnable elections. And so we're not getting a mulligan on 2024. We got to get it done. And the Democrats are playing for keeps. If they're able to sweep and win the White House, win the House, win the Senate, they are going to pack the U.S. Supreme Court. They are going to eliminate the Electoral College. They're going to make Washington, D.C. a state, and they are going to eliminate voter ID 
in every jurisdiction in this country and mandate that every state allow ballot harvesting. That is not an agenda that's speaking to the kitchen table concerns of the average American family. No, that's an agenda where they're trying to ensconce themselves in power for a generation. And if we let them get away with it, it will take us a generation to dig out of the hole that they dig. So we have a lot of work to do. President Reagan used to say freedom's one generation away from extinction. It's not passed along in the bloodstream. It needs to be cultivated and fought for. And for most of my adult life, I thought that was a little bit of an exaggeration. I mean, we're Americans, right? Isn't this just something that's in our DNA? But I don't think anyone could, could have lived through the last four or five years and not have an appreciation for how fragile freedom really is. Each generation does have this responsibility to cultivate it. Our founding fathers understood this. When they went to Philadelphia in 1787 to craft our Constitution, they came armed with the knowledge of having studied every republic in the history of mankind because they wanted to draw lessons from those experiences that they could apply here in America. And what they figured out was all those republics, there was really only one thing that they all had in common, and it was this. Every one of them had failed. And so they understood it fell to the United States of America to determine, can people really govern themselves? Can you have a society based on the idea that our rights come from God, not from the government? That we live under a rule of law, not a rule of individual men? Or was mankind forever destined to live under various forms of despotism? And they fully expected that this country would be the ones that ultimately decided the fate of freedom in the world. And when Benjamin Franklin walked out of that convention, he was asked, Dr. Franklin, what have you given us, a republic or a monarchy? He said, a republic if you can keep it. They understood you could have the best declaration of independence in the world, you can have the best constitution in the world. These things do not run on autopilot. They require citizens to be engaged and to fight for the preservation of these freedoms. So uh, our duty, is to preserve what the founder of our country called the sacred fire of liberty. It's a fire that burned in Independence Hall in 1776 when 56 men pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to establish a new nation conceived in liberty. It's a fire that burned at a cemetery in Gettysburg when our first Republican president pledged this nation to a new birth of freedom. It's a fire that burned 79 years ago on the shores of France when a merry band of brothers stormed the beaches of Normandy, defeated the Nazis, and preserved freedom in this world. It's a fire that burned at the foot of the Brandenburg Gate at the Berlin Wall in 1987 when a Republican president said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall and defeated communism in the process. So we are our generation now is called upon to carry this torch. It's a responsibility that we should not shy away from. It's a responsibility we should welcome. Uh, we have to stand firm for the truth, and we have to remain resolute in defense of core American and enduring principles. I believe we have it within our power to reverse American decline. And here's my pledge to you. Uh, if you help me be the Republican nominee for president in 2024, you can set your clock to January 20th, 20, uh, 2025, high noon on the west side of the Capitol, because I'll have this hand on the Bible, I'll have this hand in the air, and I will be taking the oath of office as the 47th president of these United States. No excuses. I will get it done, and we will restore the great United States of America. Thank you all. God bless the great people of North Carolina.